So we're about 10 minutes over where we were scheduled to be on the agenda. So I'd like to uh, keep going. Um, this is the beginning, I think, of our more in-depth work group discussion and recommendation development as to what our next steps uh, should be or not be. I think um, some thoughts I've been having is that we could look at what would be the various options that kind of immediately come to mind and then looking through those options, um, discuss, prioritize amongst ourselves the order in which we'd like to talk about them. And I think within them we will have both uh, programmatic and governance types issues that we have to do. And one, for example, would be to do nothing. That is an option, is to have, having evaluated all to say we're not going to do anything. Another option, of course, is to say we're going to have two, mandatory and voluntary. Uh, third would be saying we're going to have some sort of hybrid that if we can think about how that would look. Uh, we had a variety of materials that were provided uh, for this meeting, a memo done by Fred and his uh, law clerk, a memo done by my law clerks, looking at a few specific um, states and how their state uh, bars are doing. I think this presentation by Mr. Green was helpful to sort of uh, get us in the legal parameters. I thought it was interesting at our last meeting, uh, we sort of had discussion of two approaches. One was sort of ideally if we were just starting with a blank slate, what would it look like? And then we had, um, and I can't remember exactly who said that, but that was sort of, I think it was more maybe Esperanza and Andrea who were sort of thinking that way. And then I think Mark Johnson and maybe Fred were saying, well, yes, that's, that's, that is an approach and that is a viable approach, but we also have to think about how we would be defending it on the back end sort of backing into it. So one is going forward, what would be good, but then we can't be so untethered or uh, loose that we're not thinking about it within the legal parameters in which we at least know we're working. As some of my colleagues say, you know, until the U.S. Supreme Court says something, we don't know. That's true. Until they say something, we don't know. But we also don't want to just be not proactive in our thinking and our consideration, which is why uh, one, at least one reason why the Supreme Court appointed this work group. Now we could do all this work and the U.S. Supreme Court could come out and say something that just undoes everything we do, when that's, and that's a possibility. But we could perhaps be lucky and do all this work and come up with something that the U.S. Supreme Court comes back and says, yeah, that's where, that's where we ended up too, or close enough that we would, <clears throat> excuse me, then be in a position to tweak or make variations. So, <coughs> I, <coughs> I'm very sorry. Um, I'm happy to approach this in any way that the work group think would be um, helpful to sort of start just putting some things on the table and coming up with a process whereby we might start addressing or giving ourselves assignments. But to this point, we mainly have been listening. And I think people are now have enough face to start at least putting things out. And I, initially, I don't want us to go like so deep or get into, I want us to be more general so that no, nothing gets taken off the table before everything's on the table. I'm one of those people that likes to put everything up. There's no bad idea. There's no, there's no limitation. And then with that information, then we can say, okay, well, these are the ones we have. What order do we want to do? And then we'll, then we'll start doing a little deeper dives and having a plan. So people's thoughts about well, other, other people's suggestions of how we might do it, additional or different, uh, and then also uh, where we want to begin. Uh, Paul? Well, in the spirit of sort of brainstorming and, and kind of putting things out there, it seems to me that it might be worthwhile to, you know, look at, maybe you suggested there's sort of three structures, you know, as, you know, sort of buckets or, you know, uh, paradigms, and then look at each of those from 
both the you know compelled political speech and association you know risk factors and issues, the antitrust you know concerns, um, and then a variety of other sort of uh, you know kind of pros and cons. Uh, if you look at the the memo that your clerk produced, you can see you know just things kind of jump right out. You know, Virginia has I think it was fifty eight thousand you know folks in the mandatory bar and about five thousand in the voluntary bar. So you know, right there, that kind of jumps out at you, saying, "Oh, well, that's not a very robust professional association that has atrophied significantly." So that you know, so just maybe sort of brainstorming the pros and cons of each model, the regulatory profile and risks of each model, uh, if there's risks, uh, compelled speech risks, are there factors we could bullet point to mitigate those, or to measure those? Uh, that'd be my, you know, consistent with sort of a methodical marching through it and brainstorming. Uh, that seemed like something, you know, that would make sense to me. Thank you, Paul. Does it make sense to go around and have work group members sort of just do their first weigh-in? of where they would be, and you can pass if you're, or you can jump on somebody else's uh, position. So how about Kyle, you next? I took some time over the weekend to go through all the comments that have been uh, generated and they're on our website. And many of them expressed the opinion that we should have a uh, voluntary and mandatory bar. But I think where that comes from is not the fact that they want to bifurcate. Um, it comes from the fact that they don't want to pay for um, what they feel is political speech. Um, and uh, thinking about that, and that being the, the base of where that sentiment comes from, it's not necessarily that those folks who may be, you know, more outspoken than others um, feel that we should bifurcate. It's we need to, in, at least in my opinion, we need to take a look at how we perhaps section off the political speech from having been being funded by our membership. And what I'd like to see and, and maybe propose and something that we should consider is as, as we sit right now, we're an opt-out um, of the Keller um, program. So if somebody complains, then we, we go in, we may do an analysis of what the political speech is, and then we do a refund. I'd like to can think about how we could be an opt-in, an opt-in, still an in integrated bar, but we have those those issues that could be considered political speech um, or association issues. Um, and we figure out what that is. And then when people are licensed, they decide whether they want to pay that fee or not. And maybe there's some some incentives that we can have for people to do that. Like in Nebraska, they have free CLEs for for folks. And maybe that might be an incentive for people to opt in. Um, I would, I, I, I think long and hard about that 1961 case from Wisconsin, where Wisconsin went from a uh, voluntary bar to an integrated bar, because they saw that the, the voluntary bar was not didn't have the membership. It was struggling to do many of the access to justice issues that they wanted to accomplish. And I don't. I, I want to avoid that. I want to avoid going back to maybe you know uh, some of the mistakes that were made in the past and some of the the advancements to to protect against that. So it would be my opinion that we we stay the integrated bar, but we do it as an opt in. And we figure out how do we motivate people to want to be a part of the, the voluntary part and fund that um, through incentives and otherwise. Thank you. Dan? Um, I, I would say yes to that as well. I, I, I think for the staff here, I think it would make sense for us to try to try to, I mean, the model we have, and then we, we tweak that, but not I mean to do a uh, um, a slate being clean because uh, 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 I mean I, I mean I, I mean right now staff is uh, I mean I, I, I mean they're set and I think to do, doing that if we just started from scratch that you know and that'll cause a lot a lot more stress for you know and and whatnot so yes ma'am 
Thank you, Dan. Dory, do you want to weigh in now or keep going? All right, let's go to Mark Johnson, please. Well, um, I don't know what we should do. Uh, you know, I mean, I think, I think um, Madam Chief Justice's suggestion that we just vet the issues over these meetings, basically, he didn't quite say that, and, and do nothing might be the best thing to do since otherwise we're really just reading tea leaves about the, what the U.S. Supreme Court is going to do. Um, certainly, we don't want to spend the time now uh, taking the steps to untangle, uh, uh, you know, what we would perceive to be the regulatory side versus the discretionary voluntary side, because that is going to be a Herculean task. And, uh, but, you know, it, I, I can't imagine the United States Supreme Court is going to just completely dissolve uh, and, and abrogate the regulatory authority of courts around the country that has gone on for many, many years with respect to admissions and discipline and what we all can probably agree are the really basic core functions to to uh, create and, and maintain a bar association of lawyers that are capable and ethical. And those, I think those are the key words. So, but after that, you know, there's an expression. Uh, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And with respect to discretionary and regulatory functions, when you get beyond admissions and discipline, and we start to move uh, in the direction of our access to justice programs and other things, there are lawyers out there that are going to say that's absolutely discretionary and I don't, I don't want to pay for it. And there are lawyers and judges that are going to say that is part and parcel of, of a professional obligation to ensure a diverse, healthy bar association. And, and you know, I, I'm assuming the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court will answer that for us at some point. But, um, you know, at this point, I think we just have to consider options. And, uh, you know, we definitely don't want to take the step of going forward and saying we're going to try to decide now, you know, what is, uh, 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 what are core functions, uh, apart from, you know, admissions and discipline, character and fitness. I think those things are a given. But we've talked a little bit about, for example, the, you know, lawyer assistance program and those things, which some of us uh, uh, think are, are are important and, and uh, the Bar Association uh, uh, should and the Supreme Court play an important role in, in maintaining those, but I think those are the kind of uh, 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 functions that we may very well see are on the chopping block by the U.S. Supreme Court when the time comes. So, Thank you, Mark. Fred? I did spend some considerable amount of time thinking about this, and two things I didn't think about <laughs> was Kyle's mention of the opt-in, and I think that's very intriguing. I did... Um, sort of share Dan's thoughts about, um, I don't really want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think he said, you know, sort of cleaning slate. I, I think we probably are saying the same thing there. But what I did is I went back to our work group charter. <laughs> I guess it's like you, you learn when you go before the Washington State Supreme Court, if they ask you a question, you try to answer that question. And I figured that our questions were proposed in our charter, which told us that we're to review and assess the structure of the WSBA in light of, one, recent U.S. Supreme Court decisions, two, recent reorganizations of other state bars, and three, administration of the Supreme Court boards. So ba based, on, based on that charter, I, I came up with uh, four things that I thought we should consider recommending to the Supreme Court. Um, first, we should advise the court of structural changes, if any, that are needed in light of the Janus case. And I really appreciate the materials we've had so far and the chance to research this. And I think the answer to that is relatively easy. Um, Professor Ch Chimerinsky and other scholars say um, no change is needed. And I, I agree with that. I think having read those cases and things, um, Janus doesn't force us to make a change. I didn't know that going into this, but I, I believe that to be the case now. The second point is that if we don't make any structural changes due to Janus, is there anything that we should recommend to the Supreme Court that should be done to make sure that the First Amendment rights are protected um, in light of the Janus decision? And with respect to this issue, my assessment um, is not complete, but it may be that we suggest to the Supreme Court to continue to zealously review 
the free speech issues, you know, does it need to be audited? Do we need an examiner or whatever? I think we must remain vigilant in making sure that the distinctions between um, appropriate speech and compelled speech are there. And that's just the, something we have to always make sure is done. And if we're not doing that, uh, we do risk litigation. Um, I've been corporate counsel, and sometimes what you're doing is you're doing pre preventative me medicine. And, and that's what we need to do here is to make sure that we are um, not being lax in, in our protection of free speech. doesn't mean that we're doing anything wrong. It means that maybe the protections that we put in place have to be policed. Um, the third point is uh, what structural changes should we recommend to the Supreme Court be made to address the antitrust issues raised in the North Carolina dental examiner's case? Um, to this, I, I very much appreciated uh, Mr. Green's lecture. You've seen my memorandum. I think I, less articulately than Mr. Green, said the same thing. Um, in other words, when he was talking, I was nodding. I said, yes, I think that's right. Um, to this point, to this third point, as set forth in my memorandum, I think we should recommend to the court to make it clear that the Board of Governors is an advisory board, that the Supreme Court is the entity that needs to make these decisions. And if we do that, um, and, and this is actually done, we are going to avoid litigation. Or if maybe you don't avoid the litigation, but you would prevail in the litigation if it, if it um, took place. Now, there are some things, you know, we can't wait for the Supreme Court to say certain things that we have to act because they haven't said. But with respect to the antitrust issues, the Supreme Court of the United States has spoken and, and we should listen. Um, fourth and finally, um, my, my suggestion is that, um, or what is it that we can recommend after reviewing um, changes in other states? That, again, was part of the charter that we had um, here, I think we learned, and especially at our last meeting, I think we learned that Washington is a national leader when it comes to access to justice, and we should continue to lead rather than follow. We can look at what other states have done, but I don't think they've done as much as we've done. And just because they've done something different doesn't mean we should do it. I think we should continue to lead. In short, the work of the Supreme Court appointed Access to Justice Board and, and other um, similarly motivated Supreme Court boards should continue. Uh, those are the four things that I suggest that we consider recommending to the Supreme Court. Thank you. Eileen. Thank you, Fred. Eileen. Well, I... I suppose this will highlight some of our difficulty because um, while I agree that we should provide a recommendation evaluating our bar in light of Jan particularly Janice and Sherman, I pretty much completely disagree with your conclusions of the effect of that evaluation. And I speak as someone, I think there is a great underappreciated value in a mandatory integrated bar and in particularly these times, compelling people, if you will, to sit down and talk about issues from a variety of perspectives, primarily through the sections, but the Council on Public Defense and the other um, work that the State Bar has done over the years. I, I, I just think that's an incredible civic value. But... In my perspective, uh, particularly in light of Janice, uh, at first I thought, well, a variation on the opt-in would be to say, all right, all the dues are voluntary. So we'll just have people pay if they want to join the bar. And then if there's not enough money there, the Supreme Court can raise it, and at some point that's going to self-correct to a level that the members want to support. But Janice talks about more than money, talks about association, 
and that compelled associations are as um, implicate First Amendment rights just as much as the compelled subsidization of speech. And Mr. Janus was not required to even join this union. If we have a mandatory bar association, we are effectively saying people must associate. And that means you must associate often with speech that uh, you may not agree with. I, I happen to agree with a lot of the Bar Association speech. And as I said, I think it's been of great value over the years. But I recognize that there are people who would strongly oppose many of the work, much of the work that's been done. And I cannot say that that does not involve their First Amendment rights. And as to Sherman and the, the antitrust, if the bar were to become a, a complete captive of the Supreme Court as recommended, and I use the word captive, but if the, if the bylaws have to be approved, if the executive director cannot be fired, if the um, Board of Governors or whatever you call them are appointed by the court, then it seems to me that the association would be bound to some of the restrictions that I think are appropriate on the speech of the court in this state. I mean, there are states that have partisan political uh, races for the, their courts, and, and we do not. I, and I think that's incredibly important. But for example, I've sat here and listened to a legislative request from the corporations, maybe it was corporate, somebody, about something as benign as asking the legislature to expand uh, shareholder meetings to include video um, presentations. I, I don't think the Supreme Court's in the business of proposing legislation. And I don't think an entity controlled as much and under the direct supervision of the court in all, it, all of these aspects would be free to do so. So that's my take. I agree we should, in light of Janice, at least be ready to respond and maybe Fleck will come out and the U.S. Supreme Court will say, well, Bar associations are so important and so special that we're just going to leave it as is. But I doubt that very much. Uh, there's obviously been a number of years trend across the country to bring litigation against bar associations that speak on some of these issues. And I would not expect that Washington would be spared. So. My approach would be to take Paul's approach about the buckets that were mentioned. We do nothing. We do what we're, oh no, maybe this is Justice Fairhurst's buckets. The, oh, the do nothing, we do the higher. Hi together. <laughs> All right, there you are. We have the mandatory and voluntary. We have a hybrid. Or we say, this is all, this is, the road is narrow and this is the road that we see going forward. But that would be my approach. The, the one last thing I would, would say that I think would be important would be to ask the leaders of the sections, and I think we talked about this beforehand, to send them Janice and say, please read this and tell us what of your work you think would be permitted under Janus and Sherman, and is there anything that would not? I, I don't. It's not decisive, but I think it would certainly be helpful in making uh, recommendations of this committee uh, to the court. I still like you. <laughs> Thank you, Eileen. Before I go to you, Hunter, I'd like to see um, if it's possible to get Andrea. Rex, because she had indicated she would have to leave about four, and then we'll come back to Hunter. And then after we hear from Jane and Esperanza, then that's when I would like us to take our break. I'd like to get through the work group members before we do, and then we'll come back and continue our conversation. So, Rex, can you check with Andrea for me, please? 
Yeah, she was on the phone with us. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, Andrea, thank oh, you. I'm, okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a little bit under the weather, too. I, I, I too, reviewed all the, um, the public comments and things of that sort, and I, I don't know, just, just to be quick and succinct, um, I guess where I am is um, a unified bar, the integrated bar. I think that um, it, it is a robust bar, and it, it, but it can stand to have improved. I don't think at this point that it, it should be abandoned. I, I know that we are doing fresh work, but I hearken back to the um, governor's task force, and I think some of those um, recommendations that came out of that seem to be a, a, um, appropriate and applicable here in terms of uh, moving from the, uh, an elected board to a board of trustees um, that's appointed by the Supreme Court. I think I read that um, as being one of the recommendations by one of the former presidents of the Bar Association as well. And I, I, the addition of the triple T's and non-lawyer members, I think those things get directly to um, a lot of the issues that were raised in the um, the dental case that we just heard the uh, the summary and analysis of. So that's where I stand. I think that the issue of access to justice and um, diversity issues. I think that those are. Uh, I, I I think that those are issues that are intricately related to the competency of lawyers. And I think that somehow that that should be incorporated into how we into the into the regulatory functions in terms of some sort of um, competency requirements along those issues. So that's where I stand presently. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you for joining us remotely. I know it's tough to sometimes come in by phone. Uh, so I would now go to Hunter. Okay. Well, thank you. I have um, just a couple of brief analytical comments, and then some proposed procedural comments. So analytically, I am persuaded by the comment that was made a couple of meetings ago, and I forget who made it, but and I think it was somebody down there, maybe it was um, Mark or Fred, but that the analysis is best approached from the perspective of what is constitutionally required and then what is optimal for our bar association for this state in 2019. And I've not come to any firm conclusions on either of those um, questions, but these are the things that I'm thinking about. I, I do recall uh, that in Janus, one of the um, comments in the opinion was that uh, Mr. Janus was uh, shanghaied into this organization um, that was subject to that particular lawsuit. And that comment and theme, I think, is reflected in a lot of the comments that this structure work group has been receiving. Um, I think we're... Can I just have you substitute mm -hmm. abducted for shanghaied? Shanghai. I wouldn't want anyone to be offended. Abducted? Don't, don't oh. use Shanghai. Don't oh. use Shanghai. So okay. just use abducted. Abducted. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, abducted. I, I think we see the um, echoes of that in some of the written comments that, that, that this organization uh, that we've received. Um, something else that I think about is that I think uh, with regard to the value of a mandatory bar association versus a voluntary bar association, and something I've been hearing from a number of folks, is that there might be potentially a generational difference here in the sense that um, tons of ink have been spilled about millennials. And I think it's, it's interesting to think about how they may approach this issue and this question. Um, and that millennials typically tend to be socially liberal uh, and more libertarian on, associ on associational issues. And so I suspect that if the current model continues, um, the challenges to the model will, will continue as millennials move through the profession. So that's, that's something else that... Um, I'm thinking about and turning over in my head as we look at this question of what is the optimal structure for the organization. As far as procedural comments, um, again, the comments are coming in. I'm reading them all. I think they're very helpful. We've got a comment from former Bar Association president. The sections are weighing in. Individual members are weighing in. I think those are great. Um, this memo prepared um, by Ms. Craig and Mr. Moon, I think is fantastic. Um, this is, it's actually more than what I had envisioned when this was discussed at the last meeting. Um, one of the things that I would propose that we do is that we use this as a tool um, going forward because I think it identifies some of the um, more common models that are out there. And what I would propose is that uh, potentially at the next meeting or the meeting after that, that we divide into subgroups and look at these various models that are out there, including our own, and look at these questions of whether or not 
um, this is something that we want to adopt, and uh, what potential improvements or changes might be appropriate for, for our bar association. So that is, that is what I have. Thank you. Thank you, Hunter. Jane. Thank you. I like going way down on the list because everybody puts out all of their great ideas, and I can just say, oh, yeah, I like that one. Yeah, I like that. I, I appreciate all that. I, Coming from a non-attorney perspective, uh, the one thing that I think I really see in what we're doing is that we're we're talking about it, and any time I feel that you have a big organization like this, I think you need to revisit it every once in a while to see is it working, is it not working, and I'm glad to see that you know we're taking this opportunity to do this, and and we've got such a diverse group to. To, to discuss that, and I guess that's kind of my one big tweak that I would like to see going forward, at, if nothing else, is that the bar become more diverse in the fact, like, right, at, at present, you really don't have a voice from the public. You don't have a voice from non-attorneys because it's always, you know, in the 30-plus years that I've been involved with working with attorneys, it's been a very coveted thing to keep the organization that we're we're going to police ourselves we're going to to keep this group just us and I think that we need to look at expanding I think that any of the groups the committees that I've been on I feel that they have all been very positively affected by non-attorneys putting their voice in. If nothing else, uh, I was speaking to one of the attorneys at, at my tribe, asking him what he thought about, if, if he had any thoughts about this. And the one thing he said, too, is that he appreciated when non-attorneys came into a court against him, because we, we do allow non-attorney spokespeople. He said it made him they would come in and they would make an argument that attorney would probably never make. But the non-attorney came in and says, well, why not? Why can't we do it this way? And I think that's something that right now the bar doesn't have somebody from the outside saying, well, why can't we do it that way? What is preventing us other than the fact that it's always been done this way? So you know, that's my big tweak. Uh, other than that, I, I I really kind of think that this bar association has been developed over a number of years, and you're going to have detours and pitfalls, and, you know, you've survived to this point, and I'm kind of of the uh, opinion, you know, don't, start everything new. Take what you have, look at it, get a new perspective from new people coming in, looking in from the outside, and tweak those little things that need to be tweaked. Overall, I, I, I don't think you can improve upon what you've got right now. As we've always said, you know, you're, we're the Washington State as a leader in many, many areas because we have people that are willing to look at what they've got right now and say, how can we improve it? And uh, there's always people that are wanting to keep it the way it was because they don't appreciate change. There are other people that want to change everything because they know that it's going to be better when, in fact, they haven't considered that, yeah, it was tried five years ago and it didn't work. It was tried 10 years ago and it didn't work. And these are the reasons why it didn't work. So, you know, let's not worry about that, but change the things that we know need to be changed. So um, I'm for definitely breaking up into the groups and, and looking at some tweaks. But overall, I would say, you know, I think you've got a good thing going and just get a little bit more diversity going on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Esperanza. Thank you. Um, 
as the other non-lawyer in this group. Um, there's a, a quote that I read today, um, or something that I heard today, in getting ready for this meeting, uh, because we have the material, but we also have a lot of history around some of the issues that have come up that brought us to this day, that where you have lawsuits in different states and different bars, there's a history behind that. It's not just in the legal realm. Uh, it's in the realm of justice, and it's in the realm of, of uh, the community and the public, and um, there's a lot more to it. But this is the, the um, statement that, that struck me was, truth is in the relatedness of fact. And there's a lot of different facts that have gone into creating the situation that bar associations are in right now. It's not one fact, it's not two, it's not three. There's a lot of facts involved in it. And the job that we have isn't just to look at these legal documents. You know, I'm listening to the, the incredible information that we're given and by the people that call in, and what a privilege to be able to have that. Um, and I, I'll be honest with you, there's times it's like, what, what does that mean, what does that mean? Because I did not go to law school. But there's common sense, and once you hear some things over and over again, you kind of get the sense of what's going on. And so being able to connect the different uh, facts together is going to lead us to something that's going to be different than what exists. I, I agree. I don't, I don't think it's good to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We have to look at what we've got and see what works and what doesn't. And I strongly believe that if we don't do it in the context and with the lens of equity and inclusion, we will be back here again trying to figure out what went wrong if we don't use those lenses. Because those lenses weren't used when our legal system was first put together, and where we are reaping the consequences of that. You mentioned the millennials, and um, you know, it's, it's interesting how all these different generations get these labels, but these different generations all have a sense and an understanding and a heartfelt feeling about what they think about our legal system. You can ask anybody. You can ask them something about some other obscure thing about music or what have you, but if you ask anybody on the street about what do you think about our legal system, they're going to have an opinion. And so, and those are facts. Their opinions are facts. We got some of them in here. We have some of the comments. Not near enough is what we need because we're, we, we just need more comments from people. We need to be able to hear from more people. Um, I know that in this meeting today, we're not going to come to a conclusion about what we're going to do. We're trying to get what we think so far from what we've heard, what we've read, what we've said to each other, maybe in passing or in meetings. Um, I think it's going to be extremely challenging, and I hope that in the end that it's going to look different than what it is. It's going to have to look different, um, and looking at justice, the paradigm of justice, and the paradigm of economics when it comes to law. And I want to hear and I want to understand the different positions that are around this table and are within the membership. What I say is what I think and what I feel. Uh, but that doesn't mean that what I think should happen can't change or can't be modified based on my understanding of how somebody else is, in, is, is not wanting to be a member of this bar because of various reasons, has criticisms about the bar, how the bar functions, um, how somebody's First Amendment rights, maybe they, they feel like they're, they're not being respected. We need to listen to those things. Um, and I also know that we have to be prepared to 
answer to somebody if what we decide and what we go forward with um, causes problems. And we know that a lot of times when we need to make changes in something like our legal system, something big, that it's not comfortable. And we might have to withstand and bear something we don't want to. The ch change is already here. <laughs> it's already here. Uh, if we're, if we're trying to push back on, on change, we need to know what the change is, we need to understand it, and then take this information that we have and the feedback that we get, not just from the emails that people send in, but we need to talk to other people and really ask folks, in the community, the people that are most, are, are impacted by the decisions that are made here aren't just the clients that private attorneys and big law firms deal with. We're talking about the Washington State Bar Association. And for the average person on the street, what that means is that's the law. How does the law affect me? How does the, the practice of law and who practices as a law, how does that affect me? How does, that, how, how does that affect different communities? That's the question in people's minds. And so we need to have that as part of our um, as, as part of our evaluation when we're going through this process. So I don't know what we're going to do, what it's going to be like in the end. I just want to make sure that we're using the lens that is the most inclusive that it can absolutely be to get us there. Thank you, Esperanza. Um, I'd like to do two things still before I get, do, do a break. One is I want to see if Dory has anything she would like to say because I find her to be an excellent uh, synthesizer. Um, I have a few comments I want to say, and then I want to let mem work group members have an opportunity, having heard what the other work group members have said, if there's anything you want to add. But I'll start first with Dory. Uh, having listened to what each of you have said, my mind went to kind of a matrix of analysis. Um, you know, analyzing a number of different, not just structures, but potential like a, additional policy uh, or governance uh, pieces that could be added into uh, any particular structure. And then going through them in the way that Paul and the uh, Chief Justice spoke about in terms of analyzing each one of those options or, or um, elements for what I hear a variety of um, interest suggesting, for example, the degree of uh, inclusivity, the uh, impact to the public, how this would reconcile to Janus, how it would reconcile to an antitrust concern, uh, whether it's yet ripe uh, or whether we feel like it's maybe premature given the state of the law and how it's developed. We could come up with a number of criteria along one axis and a number of of either structural or government governance issues that you'd like to explore, and then just kind of work through what you what you consider their advantages or disadvantages or relative value uh, for each component. If that if that kind of analysis is helpful, okay. anyone who wishes to comment on earlier comments, I think Paul did. Paul. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to circle back because what I had said previously was more on process and how to get to sort of what I think of as an optimal result. And then folks around the table spoke very articulately about what they saw as that path or that end result of uh, an ideal result. I think it is very important for us to use this opportunity to come up with uh, you know, if there's going to be changes, and I assume there are going to be, how do we optimize what is the Washington State Bar Association? Uh, it's a very long putt, but, you know, you can also think of it as a, uh, you know, it's a spectrum of optimal. You know, you're going to hit the whole, you know, 50 yards out, I don't know. Um, when I look at that hole way out there, and I think about what everyone around the table said, and I think about what we've heard about antitrust concerns and what we've heard about compelled speech and compelled association, uh, what I've heard about, you know, the benefits of the bar in terms of access to justice, the perspective that I mostly come from, which is, hey, how can we make the 40,000 members of this bar, you know, the most excited about being attorneys and doing a great job and supporting uh, this diverse range of practices, 
Um, you know, it's a whole it's a whole spectrum of things. I, I come from that perspective because I think everything works better for the Washington State Bar Association when everyone is happy with the Washington State Bar Association. I just to me it's just sort of logical. The most the most support for an entity, I think the more power it has, the more momentum it has. Um, so when I look at everything we've looked at, I look at the antitrust concerns and those issues from the perspective of, well, those are some pretty good concerns, competition and providing support for access to justice, um, allowing more folks into the profession, giving consumers more opportunity. I think all those concerns are, are very helpful, and it's just sort of a reminder of, I think, what we, we, we have sort of done, but I think we should revisit, which is what things have we really ensured the court is deciding that could raise antitrust concerns by way of rules or, you know, advertising, uh, ethics issues. Um, and I think it's just a great refresher for everybody that that's why, you know, in large part we have this structure set up. We, uh, we also then kind of heard some things around the table about is sort of mixing the antitrust and the uh, and the, the compelled speech issues. And I think it was Fred who said, well, I think we should have the court – oversee, you know, whether or not we are we forcing constitutional issues around compelled speech or compelled association. I think that's a pretty interesting idea. I kind of like the idea as, as to what Dory was saying, or, you know, some little tweaks that would work with any structure. Well, in, in, the, in, the, in the integrated model, giving members an opportunity to appeal to the court formally or informally, like, hey, I'm seeing some compelled speech, I'd like it to stop, and here's the, what I'm talking about, you know, sort of that kind of supervision. Um, I, I, at the same time, when I hear folks say, oh, I think all the, the, you know, the, all the powers of the board should be merely advisory and, uh, you know, all the governors should be appointed by the court, I think that goes in a direction that sort of offends the sensibilities of 40,000 lawyers who want to have a voice. It's kind of their association goes back to 1888. So I think you have to calibrate and blend things so that you optimize um, and not turn away a lot of members who want to have a voice. They're used to having a voice. Um, the court has always exercised, you know, this plenary authority, but in varying degrees of, uh, of oversight and influence. The court does not need to have really any oversight or influence, in my view, over the sections. The sections do what they do. They're not compelled speech. I heard someone say, well, you know, oh, and I think, I think it was Eileen said, well, you know, do you, are any of your activities compelled speech? I don't think they can be. The sections are voluntary. All 29 sections are voluntary. Um, so uh, I think there's something to be said about, you know, making sure that the, the lawyers retain their voice over the things that are kind of within the professional purview, you know, the, the mentoring and, and uh, you know, educating each other, uh, sharing professional opportunities and development. Um, I don't think the court needs to play a really close role in that. I think also that an elected board acting as a board of directors is a very good model for ensuring financial responsibility. I'm not sure that an elected, you know, that a, an appointed board has the same um, independence, that it comes at it with that same uh, uh, perspective. So I think that there's the idea of, you know, collecting all these thoughts, brainstorming, going through this framework of analysis and say, what are the pros and cons and how could we fix this? And what subtle adjustments do we make to that? Not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, but looking at everything pretty carefully to get to how do we avoid antitrust issues? How do we avoid uh, compelled speech and compelled political association issues? But how do we optimize the outcome of the bar, the outputs of the bar in terms of access to justice and in terms of uh, diversity, inclusion, and professional development and professional association and the energy that the lawyers bring to an organization that has some voluntary aspects to it? Thank you, Paul. Mark Johnson. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the I think Kyle's suggestion that we flip the Keller deduction from an opt out to an opt in is spot on. It is it's a small tweak. It's 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 vulnerable to the you know uh, compelled speech. They've raised it in some of the cases around the country. I think we can do that fairly easily. Although you know the the, the state bar staff has, has to <laughs> implement all these things, but I absolutely think that helps us. Then we can take some baby steps. I think we ought to take a good look at GR twelve. And, and um, you know, I know it's been amended in recent years, but our Supreme Court 
could probably tweak that language uh, to, to, to make it very clear that our court, our regulatory uh, authority, believes that certain, certain things are required to ensure a capable and ethical uh, uh, bar association. You know, I mean, uh, the, the, the rule, I think, was changed for the better here. Uh, 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 was it a couple of years ago? Were you, was it 2018 or 16 or something? But, they've, but you know, there's, I, I think we really need to take a good, uh, good look at, at that because uh, our Supreme, you know, what, we're, what we ought to think about is, is, is making it clear in the event of a challenge that our court controls this bar association. And, and not the market participants, if you will. And so uh, I, I think we, we need to look at I think we look, have to look at how our Keller deduction is calculated. I've been doing some research for an article, and, you know, our Keller deduction last year for, uh, for somebody in, in my, uh, <laughs> my age group uh, or my, uh, the years that I was admitted was a, a dollar and a quarter. And for the younger lawyers, it was less than a dollar. That's uh, the lowest that I could find in the country. Uh, by a not insignificant amount, so that also is is going to be a vulnerability. I think that that you know that w we may be we may be painting a little bit of a broad brush here with respect to what really uh, our our members should be compelled to pay on their annual professional licensing fees. Thank you, Mark. Others, please, Jane. Uh, just kind of a note of observation. Uh, I was on the practice of law board for a number of years, and the one thing I learned from that board is no matter what we do here today, there's going to be unhappy people. And there's going to be people that are yelling and screaming who haven't read what we've done. I mean, that was just a given. So I think that we need to keep that in mind, that we can only do the best we can, and, uh, you know, we're going to have those people out there that no matter what we do here, there's going to be yelling and screaming, and, you know, so we have to keep that in mind too, I think. Anyone else? All right, so my thoughts... Um, a comment was made about how people, I can't remember exactly who made it, but paying mandatory dues sort of versus voluntary dues. And I think part of it is some just want to pay for what they want. They don't want to pay. They, they want, they'll, whatever it costs for regulation, okay, that's good. I think part of um, Representative Stokesbury's bill, from my discussion with him, and hearing later discussions or conversations by him was that really he and a number of his uh, colleagues in the in where he practices just want to pay pay a much smaller amount. They don't they don't want everything else. And so I think that's something that doesn't necessarily impact us, but the person on the street and what they're thinking and not thinking. Some are just like. I'll pay what I have to pay, and then other groups would say, well, I like all these other things. And what's in or out would be a big discussion, equity, diversity, access to justice, lawyers' assistance program. That all becomes whether if we were at some point looking at that, whether that was in or out. But there, are, there will be some subset that says, I'm willing to pay this, and then I want to opt in on all these other things. And whether that's part of a hybrid or that's part of uh, two associations is something we can talk about. Um, I think it's important that we consider options, but I'm really hoping at the end that we actually will have either some consensus or some recommendation to take to the Supreme Court so we don't just do all this effort and then I just get to go do it all again, uh, <laughs> which I may do anyway uh, with the with the justices, but to the extent that we're working it through and sort of analyzing each one as its own, I would sort of say its own silo, then at the end to say, okay, having looked at all of these and these are the tweaks that you would make or recommendations, as a group we have a majority position and a minority position, or we have, or we have all three. We think they're all equal, they have all pros and cons, but here's our assessment. So I'm wanting us to uh, at some point, once we've gone through the, the hard work that's still ahead of us, to then come back and say, okay, having done this hard work, 
if we if we were the Supreme Court and we just had to pick one, what would be our what would be our recommendation? So I just have a sense, so that I will be able to take a sense back to the justices. As you know, Justice Gonzalez is here today, I know, and has listened in on other meetings. Other justices are watching, so there's really a, a strong interest at all levels. Um, I completely agree that Washington State Bar Association is a leader. And even reading the memo done by my two law clerks, which thank you very much to Felicia and David for doing that, um, you read what other states are doing and you think, well, that's all nice, but that's like, hmm, not very much. <laughs> or not very much like we have. I mean, we have a whole access to justice board that has been in, in position for years with a whole uh, strategic plan. We have OCLA and OPD, and we have so many more things. Uh, we have a Judicial Conduct Commission that's separate and apart. We have um, commissions of the Supreme Court that many of these states don't appear to have or aren't coordinated. We have boards that the Supreme Court has created that are administered. We have a very active section from a very small, you know, animal law, world through peace, through real property probate and, uh, and which? Trust. Trust, right. And corporations and you know we have these these huge filling so many needs so I don't want to do anything that would unless unless legally compelled to that would diminish what is such a great association and such great work that has been being done for years and years and years you know we have people that are not supportive we are being sued you all know we're being sued in Washington they're being sued in Oregon they're becoming more sophisticated. I think they were just sort of throwing it out there. But as we go along, as more cases become refined, their arguments will become more refined. And we will, you know, we, we could end up being a test case. We might be far enough behind that we're, we won't be the test case. But if some of these are going to go up at some point. They, at some point, they won't be able to keep avoiding it, you know, probably within maybe four or five years. I don't have a time frame. Um, and I think, if, from what we were talking about procedural-wise, I think if we agreed that we would sort of start with the three, no change, two, some hybrid, and took, and Dory and I and my law clerks, and maybe others might want to work on a little subcommittee, could pull out what are the questions we have to ask under antitrust, under... Um, Sherman Act under what like sort of our our lectures that we've had and I'm not able to be more articulate at the moment than I'm being which is I recognize is not very articulate but uh, what are the questions we have to ask and then say okay looking at this is there anything we have to change and if we do then we know we'd have to have it on all three right but if we don't or only if we only if we came up with something and so we sort of check off the legal boxes and then we come back and say, okay, optimally, how would this look? So like one is the Keller opt-in versus the Keller opt-out. And you say sections are voluntary. Well, they are, except for my understanding is that they're partially subsidized. And if they're partially subsidized, then they're not completely voluntary. And there is some money link where there could be some question. Then there's also the Supreme Court doesn't really do policy. We do administration in legislative areas. Because we're going to ultimately decide the constitutionality or the statutory interpretation of that legislation. So at least I, as chief, don't think, unless it really impacts the administration of justice or the administration of the bar or something, that we should be in there. Because I think it starts blending the uh, branches and the checks and balances. That doesn't mean if we were a voluntary association that we've had a very robust bar legislative section who is looking to improve how law is uh, how um, I'm just having a tough day today how the um, what the law should be in different practice areas what will improve uh, people signing things or corporate law or real property you, you have they have a whole laundry list of things that they're taking well if we can really truly insulate them so it's not, quote, bar subsidized in any way just because of the way we set it up, or in fact, we say perhaps the Bar Association is out of legislation business. 
the, the bar, the mandatory side of the bar is out. But the, legis- the section side, well, they're all in. That's their whole reason. But they pay money specifically. They opt in to do Keller for that. And that's just in its own, you know, you set up with Ann. It has its own little separate silo where it's a dedicated fund. So there's just not any question that we're not crossing it. So it's that. I don't want to go into that detail right now, and I know you're way overdue for a break. But it's those types of things that I think at some point we would dig down into as to how that could work or not work. And I think there's some big sort of big guideposts that we could attack or address at the next meeting, the legal kind of side. And as part of that, then we would start pulling out the optimal side. What do, are people, comments on my comments? Sounds good. Thank you, Paul. All right. So I have on the big, on the clock over here, I have 408. We are going to take a 15 minute break to 423. And we will come back and we'll have a half hour, 37 minutes to sort of wrap up and then uh, make our plan for next time. So I think we're almost to the, uh, future agenda items when we come back, okay? So think about next steps and weighing in on what we'll do. So you have until 423, please. Red clock.